The SpaceX Starbase water deluge system just conducted its first full test with a lot of water. Indeed, this was an epic splash pad. When the Starship Super Heavy rocket lifts off, its 33 Raptor engines can produce 17 million pounds of thrust, and with that comes a torrent of heat and noise. To help protect the Starship rocket, launch mount Mechazilla and launch pad from the extreme acoustic and temperature environment, water will spray onto the launch pad during ignition and liftoff. During yesterday's water deluge test, thousands of gallons of water were delivered in less than a minute. But in comparison with other launch platforms, but in comparison with other platforms, this is roughly half of the volume of the SLS's deluge system. In the case of NASA, the system releases approximately 450,000 gallons of water across the mobile launcher and flame diverter to control the extreme energy generated by the rocket during ignition and liftoff. This can be inferred that SpaceX's deluge system is certainly capable of becoming more powerful. In any case, this is just the first test. SpaceX is preparing to advance to the next round of tests as a continuous stream of water tankers has been arriving throughout the day following the completion of the previous test. So, anticipate witnessing another test taking place sometime this week, which is expected to exhibit noticeable differences compared to the initial. I'd expect at least one more partial pressure test, one or two full pressure tests, then static fires and post S F tests to verify performance. Another thing to note is this system operates entirely different from the systems at the Cape. It's not a sound suppression system. Starship does not need one. This design is adding water directly where it needs to be in order to soak up thermal energy from the engine plume. The water pressure is not there to counteract the force. The steel is. The water is there to carry away the heat energy. At each hole, the water has to have enough pressure to continue to flow against the stagnation pressure of the rocket exhaust but the plate reacts to the majority of the exhaust pressure directly. I hope SpaceX gives us some stats on liters per second and water pressure for this system. After all, Musk has the coolest shower on the planet. So here's hoping for his and his company's success. A 33-engine machine is a nightmare for the plumbers, one that calls to mind the old Soviet Union's 30-engine N1 moon rocket, which never successfully flew and in one test in 1969 blew up just after after liftoff, causing the largest explosion in space history. Starship's ultimate success or failure is immensely consequential. Not only is it crucial to SpaceX's future as a company, it also underpins the U.S. government's ambitions for human exploration. Its rival China is formalizing its plans to land a pair of astronauts on the surface of the moon before the end of the decade. A preliminary plan to put two astronauts on the moon for a short period to conduct scientific tasks and collect samples was presented by Zhang Hai Lian, Deputy Chief Designer with the China Manned Space Agency, or CMSA, at the 9th China International Commercial Aerospace Forum in Wuhan, Hubei Province, July 12th. The mission envisions a crewed spacecraft and lander segments launching separately on a pair of under-development Long March 10 rockets. The crewed spacecraft and landing stack will rendezvous and dock in lunar orbit ahead of a moon landing attempt. A new generation crew spacecraft will have a mass of 26 tons and be capable of deep space flight and high-velocity atmospheric re-entry. China has already carried out a full-scale boilerplate flight test of a version of a new-gen spacecraft in a relatively high orbit. The landing segment will consist of a lander and a propulsion stage with a total mass of around 26 tons. The propulsion stage will be used for entering lunar orbit and descent towards the lunar surface. The lander will be capable of soft landing on the moon and returning the astronauts to lunar orbit. The lander will be equipped with four 7,500 Newton variable thrust engines. Zhang said the mission is very sensitive to mass constraints, meaning a lightweight design and integrated designs are necessary. We also need to take advanced materials and structures to improve the structural efficiency and strictly control the weight, he said. A lunar rover will also be a part of the mission profile. It'll have a mass of 200 kilograms, accommodate two astronauts, and have a range of 10 kilometers. A spacesuit is also being developed by lunar surface operations with a working time of no less than eight hours, Shang said. It'll aid astronauts in water walking, climbing, driving, and operating machines on the moon. The Long March 10 will be a three-stage rocket with three five-meter diameter cores for its first stage. It'll be capable of sending 27 tons of payload to translunar 
injection. The test launch of the Long March 10A, a two-stage low-Earth orbit version of the large rocket, is set for 2027. CASC recently reported progress on testing on the 130-ton thrust kerosene liquid oxygen engines for the rocket. Senior lunar scientists have in the last couple of years claimed to state media that China would possess the capabilities to land crew on the moon before the end of the decade. China has long been working on the various components required for crewed lunar missions. These include a new crew spacecraft, new launchers, and a lunar lander. The mission aims at being more than a flags and footprints campaign. China is planning to build a moon base in the 2030s known as the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS for short. China plans a series of robotic missions across the 2020s as precursors to the ILRS. These include the 2026 Chang'e 7 orbiter, lander, rover, and mini flying detector Lunar South Pole mission. Chang'e 8, currently scheduled for launch around 2028, will be an inside to resource utilization and 3D printing technology test mission. China's space activities have expanded greatly in recent years. The country has greatly increased its launch rate and completed an indigenous GNSS system and a crewed space station. Future plans include the ILRS and an unprecedented Mars sample return mission. The country, however, currently faces economic challenges which could dampen the growth on which these plans are predicated. NASA's Mars sample return plans are currently facing scrutiny and concern over the status and cost of the mission. So, I hope Starship will be successful so that it will leave the world behind. And for our last bit of news today, a Rocket Lab Electron rocket carrying seven small satellites lifted off from Rocket Lab's New Zealand site Monday at 9.27 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, or 1.27 a.m. GMT, on July 18th, after being delayed by a few days due to bad weather. Rocket Lab called the mission, the company's 39th to date, Baby Come Back, and there is a good reason for that. About 17 minutes after liftoff, the Electron's first stage came back to Earth, making a soft splashdown under parachutes in the Pacific Ocean. Rocket Lab plans to recover the booster with a ship and haul it back to land for inspection and analysis. Such work is part of the company's effort to make the first stage of the 18-meter Electron reusable, like that of SpaceX's workhorse Falcon 9 rocket. There are key differences between the two recovery strategies, however. For example, Falcon 9 boosters steer themselves to powered vertical touchdowns. Electron is too small to have enough fuel left over for such maneuvers. Hence the parachutes. Booster recovery is a secondary objective of Baby Come Back, of course. The main goal was to get the seven satellites to orbit safely. Four of those payloads are tiny CubeSats for NASA's Starlink mission. That's Starlink mission, which is designed to test tech for future swarm missions. Spacecraft swarms refer to multiple spacecraft autonomously coordinating their activities to achieve certain goals. Rocket Lab wrote in a mission description. Baby Come Back is also lofting the LEO-3 demonstration satellite for the Canadian communications company Telesat and two CubeSats for Spire Global, a Virginia-based company whose satellites observe Earth in radio frequencies. Well, folks, that wraps up our show for today. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.